All right, uh, I think we're going to get started. Welcome everybody to our first live webinar. My name is Chris Patterson. I am the Director of Business Solutions here at Food Services of America in Spokane, Washington. Business Solutions is the restaurant consulting wing for Food Services of America. We get we have the honor of helping our great cu partner customers thrive in in this challenging business market that we call the restaurant industry. This webinar is is part of what we call the Business Advantage series. I myself have 25 years general manager experience from uh, some independent restaurants where we didn't have systems or processes or anything of that nature. Uh, all the way down, I got the good fortune of working with some chain restaurants where I got to learn structure and processes and systems and uh, became a, a sales associate with Food Services America uh, about 11 years ago and have now been consulting for the last eight years. Uh, joining us today is Chef Alexa Wilson. Hi, everybody. Actually, uh, it's kind of ironic. Chris was my last sales associate in the last restaurant that I had in, in the real world, where I think most everybody that's listening to us today is, uh, is living their, their life. Um, I'm the corporate executive chef for FSA Spokane, and my background is 25 years in food service. Uh, the chef uh, mostly back in the kitchen, and, and that's what I refer to as the heart of the house. Uh, food service chose me. I really didn't choose it, and I think that that's probably something that a lot of us have in common today is that we've gotten into this industry out of a passion or a drive uh, for taking care of people and really have a great love for, for this amazing industry that we're in. Um, to support your business advantage, our FSA business solutions teams offer a variety of these kind of complimentary services. So uh, those services can include one-on-one uh, -on -one consulting, group seminars, we do trainings, management and team consultings, and now webinars. And since we're business solutions, we're actually going to start calling these solutionars. Good story. I love it. All right. I am uh, not an accountant. I just want to make sure we're clear on that. I am a restaurant operations guy. That's my background. And, and the thing that I found with the traditional restaurant P&L is it lacks information uh, for me to manage my business. I want to take action and I want to be effective in being a good manager and, and ensuring that I have profitability. And that's really what today's about is, is looking at P&Ls from an operations standpoint and really to help you understand how to use this tool to grow your business and impact your business rather than just a static report on history and what has happened in your business. Uh, we're set for about 45 minutes for the solution hour today. We'll take some questions at the end uh, as time allows, but feel free to type those in um, as we're going. So if you think of something, uh, drop that question in there and then we do have reserved some time at the end. Uh, we also have some interactive polls for you all to participate in. Good. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a couple of things, really three main points is what this prime cost thing is and why it's a powerful metric for your business. And then really how to use the information from your P&L to grow revenue. It, it can be a really powerful tool if we look at it from the right point of view. And lastly is how to use these tools to secure a more reliable and consistent bottom line. All of those bring information to us and we really, what we want to do is be able to utilize this information to your advantage. Well, and really the restaurant industry is unique in a lot of ways. Uh, not only are we the largest industry in our, in our nation, but we have some, let's just say, quirks and things that make it not just uh, how easy is it to cook a hamburger, let's go into business. Uh, that's why this prime cost view of accounting is really exciting because it's empowering and it puts us in a proactive versus a reactive business situation. Absolutely. It, it's the dynamic of labor in our restaurant business model is, is the big changer on it. And, and we're going to compare the retail business world to the restaurant business world a little bit to demonstrate why this is so important and why we need to look at our P&Ls a little bit differently. So before we do that comparison, let's uh, do a little poll here, everybody. Uh, Real simple, how often are you getting your P&Ls out there? Are you on a monthly cycle? Are you uh, on a weekly cycle? Is it kind of like whenever the accountant gets it to you, which is fairly common? And uh, for those of you that you're doing it yourself, is it dependent on your own schedule and, and how busy you are? Wow, that's some activity going on right now. 
looks like monthly and weekly. Uh, just a few people are actually at the mercy of their accountant. Hopefully they have a proactive one. Um, but monthly is definitely the the common thread. And for Chris and I who consult in four different states, that's kind of kind of an average what we see. It's still going up and down. We've got 45% monthly, some some actually weekly. That's a good thing. Weekly is really good. And and that's one of the preferences that I have is making sure I have information as fast as possible. The real question here is how reactionary do you all feel to this process? Is your uh, process so far behind that you really get these numbers and then, well, what the heck do I do with it? Because it's been so long since since the numbers started that it feels not really like something you can control or, or set goals with. So let's take a look at these two accounting methods and see if we can resolve some of that feeling of being behind. So looking at the retail, I'm going to, I'm going to pick on the local hardware store for a little bit. And really there's two different activities happening in here. And when we buy products, we both sell products. We both have sales. We both carry products. We both, uh, service customers and we both hopefully make money at the end of the year. The difference between the two really is that in the retail model, if I buy a case of hammers and, and my sales drop 50% at the end of the month, I still have a case of hammers. They're just probably a little bit dusty and I need to have somebody wipe them down a little bit, but I still have hammers. If we have that 50% drop and I just bought a case of ribeyes, Oh, chef has a problem now because that becomes expensive trash or not very profitable soup. And it's it's a big, big problem in the industry. So the difference between the two cost of goods is the value on the retail side doesn't change. The value on the restaurant side, our inventory quality degrades, you know, in terms of produce by the day. So it's really a very, uh, very volatile piece of the business compared to us. Probably why I referred to it as quirky. <laughs> That's the quirky part. The other quirky part really is the labor piece. So stay, staying with the hardware store, walking through the hardware store, you've got somebody working the paint aisle. you got somebody working in lumber, somebody working with the tools, three people on the floor. Then you go to, you pick up your stuff and then you walk up to the counter and there are two physical cash registers, meaning there are two people to take the revenue, to take the sales. That's it. That's the way it goes. Whether the sales jump 50% or sales drop 50%, yeah, they can send some people home, but a sudden increase in sales really doesn't change the experience a whole lot. In our restaurants, if we have a 50% jump in revenue or jump in sales, covers, transactions, whatever we want to call it, all of a sudden the experience dramatically changes for our customers. And then on the flip side of that, if we have a 50% drop in sales, Okay, yeah, we can send people home. We can't send the ribeyes home. We're stuck with them. So I can wait in line a little bit longer to buy the hammer because ultimately I'm taking it home to do the purpose that the hammer is is providing. I can't wait longer at the restaurant and think that as a customer I'm having the same experience or that I'm going to tell people that it was great or that I'm going to come back seeking that same experience. This is really where the retail-based experience versus the hospitality-based experience changes and looking at that labor cost up front with the management team becomes critical. Right. I mean, it, we're, we are in the restaurant industry. We are in the experience and the memories business. That's what we're in. And uh, I don't know if you remember the last time you had a great hardware store visit. That's just not in the, it's not in that business model. Ours is quite a bit different. Actually, usually it's when I find the guy who will help me figure out which hammer it is, which is where the retail model ices their cake with a little bit of hospitality. Right. Okay. So let's, uh, you really, it's, it's, this is the reason of the beneficial look, uh, at our financials differently. Labor is the biggest area of opportunity for consciously growing our sales. Um, it's because ultimately you're sa you get the sales you schedule for. So what that really means is when your restaurant is understaffed, it's a proven fact that check averages are going to drop. Your staff is busy with the logistics of moving food around and moving dishes around, but they are not upselling. They don't have time to tell people what the soup and the special are. They don't have time to check back and make sure those extra drinks are done because they're just pushed to get things done. Uh, also, when 
they don't have time to upsell. That's not the only piece is efficiency goes down, mistakes go up, and your general profitability really suffers. So looking at this prime cost piece and moving labor up into the top piece of it, that becomes an integral part of the business model. It's really critical. And that P&L statement can really help you understand the service level also. Well, and from there, you can start budgeting and forecasting, which means you're managing your business proactively and can get ahead of it. Okay, so the first thing to know about really the P&L as a whole is uh, accountants use a different language to run. Yeah, they their, sure do. It's different than our language for sure. So uh, they can make it seem a lot more difficult than when it really is. For example, sales can be called revenue or income. Uh, costs can be called expenses. Profits could be also referred to as net income. But it gets con really confusing. But ultimately, it's a pretty simple process as itself. The, um, the name of the game, though, is really to follow this simple formula coming up. So basically what you sell things, this is the income or the positive on that top of that statement. That's the start. This is where we get to feel rich in the restaurant industry too, because it's our top line sales. It's a driving factor for a lot of folks who get into the industry, uh, but we still have to pay all these bills. And here come the bills. Uh, really, this is where we start populating where we're spending money. And we, you can break it down in the, on the P&L, but the, ultimately these are all the expenses and just how we categorize them and knowing where it all goes. This is the minus of the formula. So we've got the plus and we've got the minus. Then moving on at the end of the formula, this is the completion of the equation. It's plus minus equals sales minus expenses equals profit or loss. So this is where Chris and I get asked about this air quotes restaurant formula. I'm glad and, you said air quotes. <laughs> uh, and, and really the restaurant formula is just as simple as this. It's a mathematical equation that tells you whether you're making money or losing money. And then you can expand on it into really great detail to see where pieces of your formula can work for you. The idea is to develop your formula, be happy with it, and then go out front where your guests are and ensure that it happens. That's right. So this is where the hardware store kind of breaks it down. And we're going to go counterclockwise. We're starting with sales. This is where the money's coming in the front door. And then on the moving to the left, you've got cost of goods. This is the raw product of the hammers and the lumber and the paint. This is where their gross profit comes in. And then everything else populates into other expenses cost of service, you know, the power, electricity, all of the other stuff it takes to run the business. And lastly is the profit or loss. This is, this is the standard P&L format that the accountant needs really to pay the bills and support your business. So let's take a look at that in a little bit more detail then, Chris. Okay. So this is the way it looks out. So if you're looking, you're basically looking at the traditional standard P&L lookout. So we've got your total sales, less cost of goods equals the gross profit. So those are the hammers and the hardware and, and all the other pieces of that. But right now, my wages, salaries, and benefits are second to the very bottom line on this. So it's way down at the bottom. I have to search down there for it to find that other critical piece of what's driving my business. Because in this model, as we mentioned at, at the hardware store, it's much more static as oh, far as the labor. Because I can wait in line for the ha hammer. Bingo. Bingo. So these other expenses, these are what laid out in, in what's called a GL code. This is where they start... Uh, categorizing where everything's happening inside the business. How many GL codes do you think people should have? Well, that's up to you. And a GL code is a term, uh, accounting term for general ledger. So this is basically a ledger. And then what we do is we categorize, you can have as many as you want, you can have as few as you want. It depends on what you want to do with the information. So in a restaurant, my restaurant, I might look at having a couple of GL codes for sales. So it, my overall sales would be 1.0. And then my dine-in, I might uh, categorize it as 1.2, take out 1.3, cater uh, catering 1.4. And then food costs, I can start breaking it out as well. I might oh. start with a 2, 2.0, 2.1 was dairy, 2.2 produce, and maybe canned goods, 2.3. I could have as many as I want or as few as I want, but the name of the game for me is to help me understand where the money's going. 
Okay. Well, that, I think that really, really the thing here with this GL codes from the chef standpoint, it's just a way of detailing or itemizing and we can get as detailed as we want on this. What we really recommend for anybody who's starting with this process is start basic. And then as you gain more control and understanding, you can start folding in all of those additional categories. Okay. Now let's move on to the actual prime cost model. So consider this here, looking at it clockwise again, nothing's changed as far as the sales piece. We're still having money come in the front door, but what we're gonna do moving to the left is we're now adding our top two expenses into what we call prime cost. So we have the cost of goods, that's the ribeyes and the canned goods and all of that other stuff, plus labor, because it's the dynamic of labor that really has a, a dramatic impact on the business. Then we move on to the non-controllable expenses. Those are things that are much less controllable on a direct day-to-day -day basis. And the end of the formula is profit or loss, just, just like normal. Well, think about it, though, Chris, whatever happens in your building, if it's not touched by your staff or your managers or somebody that you're paying part of that wages to, it's probably not actually in your building. So we really are in the restaurant industry dictated by what our teams are doing and the amount of time that they are being paid to do those things. It is absolutely the number one controllable inside your four walls. All right, everybody, let's uh, move on to another poll question. Which best describes your uh, current P&L? Are you doing this standard process from your accountant or a standard process from a software template that you have, more similar to that retail? Or are you actually doing this prime cost process or not doing a, uh, a, a P&L at all yet? Let's take a look at what everybody uh, is really doing out there. Looks like, oh man, these numbers are jumping around. Folks, you got uh, mostly standard P&L is what we're seeing. And uh, as Chris and I spend time with our great customers in four states, that is pretty much the majority of what we see out there. Uh, the standard P&L is something that we are paying an accountant to provide for us, and a lot of people are using it as a service to ensure that bills are paid and things like that, but maybe not necessarily using it for this view into the restaurant. Yep, so we're seeing a combo of the standard. We've got uh, somebody from the software templates, and then, you know, not uncommon is somewhat, some of us aren't doing one yet, and that's okay. We see that an awful lot. Well, Chris, I didn't get into this business to do math myself. I got into it because I have a passion for cooking. And that's a true story for a lot of us. That's why we that's why we do what we do. We have a passion for cooking or a passion for taking care of people. So digging into this a little bit more, we've moved labor off the back page and up with the total cost of, of goods category because labor is that integral part. It's so important to our business. The difference here, if you looked, if you remember back, that was their uh, direct costs, we call it prime cost. So this is this is our version of that. And really that prime cost, that is the nuts and bolts of what the owners and the management team can control in the restaurant. From the back of the house standpoint, from the chef who got into this with a passion for food and probably made really good food, but not very profitable food for a while. And then as I grew up in my career, learned that, I had to make good food and profit at the same time because that was the business side of it. Seeing these two costs that I'm responsible for right at the top of the P&L allow me to have a great conversation and some goal setting. It raises the urgency of it, absolutely. So moving on, then we also have other controllable expenses. So we'll think about the paper goods that we have to sell. Uh, as, as you look at that list, it's almost in declining order of what you can actually control. You know, uh, it's paper goods, supplies, cash over and short, emergency repair and maintenance. If you have a repair and maintenance budget, that's maybe something you're accruing for, but something breaks down, we got to take care of it. Utilities really are kind of controllable. If you have somebody walk in the door at seven o'clock in the morning and you open at 11 and they switch everything on, that can be a controllable item to some degree. We have some control over that. And the marketing and music, we can decide when and where to spend money. If, if I'm the manager, these are the things that I can actually control. 
Absolutely. So how, how do I really know what the prime cost numbers should be? Is there, is there a sweet spot or are there benchmarks or a target? There, there are some national numbers. Uh, I'll use my air quotes, national number averages. But the, the problem is, is that every business model is different. And there is a methodology that, to help, help us figure that number out. And we'll talk about that one in a minute is we have to know what your P&L truly looks like. So you can find that information from your accounting P&L directly, but the national average numbers are very, very loose guidelines. They say 60 to 65% should be your prime cost number. 5% is a pretty big swing in our industry. Right, and that's why it's it's a loose guideline. So the way we help somebody actually figure this out, uh, we sat down with uh, their, actually, their accountant's P&L, and we did the math and we laid out a whole year's worth of, of P&Ls and we added the labor, totaled up the labor like we see up there and then added it to their cost of goods. And we came up with their profit and loss uh, when they made money and when they lost money, we found out that their prime cost, the primary driver was a 61%. And if she hit a 62, she didn't make money. She hit 61, she made. 62, she didn't, 61, she made. So now is a matter of actually making sure that the elements inside that prime cost are the right numbers, that we have the right products, she's uh, selling the right items, that she's staffing the labor properly to help ensure that she was actually gonna consistently make money. So as long as she knows that 61% is that so-called sweet spot, then you can rest that your math has been done and go out and talk to your guests and make sure that they're having a great time and maybe set a goal to get down to 60. Absolutely. Yep. That's the way it works, really. The last detail really on the P&L is the non-controllable expenses. And these are really, as a manager, there's nothing I can do about these this list of items on a day-to-day -day basis. I really can't do anything about it. And if you're an owner or you're a general manager, these are things that they're just that they're there. The, the column on the left is what I can manage and control. The column on the right is really off my radar as far as the day-to-day -day operations of the business. Chris, I'm going to interrupt for just a second here because we do have one good question that has popped up, and it's if I'm a seasonal restaurant, how do I apply this to my business? Because I can see that my sweet spot might not be achievable if it's snowing like crazy outside and I'm not a ski resort. I'm a beach resort. That's a really good question. Uh, the, and coincidentally, I ran a big seasonal restaurant in Seattle. I was on the uh, down on the waterfront. I'd have seven employees in the winter and I'd have 70 during the summer. And, Holy moly. Yeah. Talk about a big swing. And, the, and the, the fact is that you can't run that same number throughout the year. You had to actually come up with your own sweet spot in season and a different sweet spot out of season. So really it was a matter of understanding what that number needs to be when you have the most revenue sales coming in the front door and how to maximize and make sure you're being as efficient as possible then, and then switching over at whatever your transition phase is and knowing what that prime cost number is to really mitigate the lack of sales there and the staffing and, and the sales that you're having at that time. So. In those cases, you are definitely running two separate businesses. Your goals are going to be different, different seasons. And if you think about it, uh, if you have 70 employees and you're doing that kind of volume in the summertime, one mistake on one of those busy days could be the equivalent of your entire December income. Absolutely. So it's going to be critical that you have a different focus in the summer when all those people are coming, if you're a summer seasonal versus in the wintertime when you're scrimping and saving. That's the illustration of what I think is one of the biggest myths in, in our industry is that volume cures all ills. It actually doesn't. It hides all mistakes. If we're really super busy and uh, we make a mistake in the summer, man, trying to make up for that in December, it's nearly impossible. Absolutely. So last details are those non-controllables. Now we're going to actually switch over and take a look at the spreadsheet that Chris has built that is going to be available for everybody. Don't worry, give us just a second. If your screen goes black, it's just because the spreadsheet is loading up. This is the same tool that you'll be able to download after the completion of the solution are. The cells will be unlocked so that you can customize it to suit your business. So for any of you that are looking at it and saying, well, I have this category or I have that category, it's entirely going to be something that you'll be able to work with and customize. And don't forget, you'll be able to rewatch this solution are to guide you through this process. 
Okay, so here we have is our, uh, this is this is my P&L, and I'm going to count it for, for May. And some things to know about the P&L first, this, this worksheet, first of all, is it's unprotected. You can edit it as you see fit, is that the white cells are, have the, have the uh, formulas in it, and the yellow cells are the action cells. So in the action cells, that's where you put your information that you need to have. So... Uh, we're reloading the, the spreadsheet right now. Don't worry, everybody. We just got a little bit of a technical glitch here, but ultimately, once you get a hold of this, you'll be able to see it and uh, populate it. Okay. So, so the yellow cells are the action cells. The white cells are open. And then there's a, you'll see these little triangle period pieces up here. This will give you the information on what what to do with that space. So if your accounting period is a month or a week or whatever, you can put that information there. Now, the thing that I would recommend you do with this is save a master copy and then begin to uh, use it and then open a new one and save it as your time period. So if you make a mistake, it's okay. You've got a backup of it. Okay, Chris. So it looks like on your restaurant here, you've got what, $32,000 in food sales and 23,000 in beverage and 2600 in takeout that's not very much that's only four percent right my retail you know it's only 400 but it's never really done anything but the nice thing about having percentages on your p l and and one of the common things that we see on the accounting p l is we're missing a percentage the percentage is the color in the story so it tells me that 55 percent of my business really is food i've got a pretty pretty fair amount of bar business and and as a manager, I'm looking at this thinking, man, I've got an opportunity in takeout. I could well, probably do something to fix it. But if you're a fine dining steakhouse, you may only be doing 4.5% takeout. Now, if you're a pizza shop and you're only doing 4.5% takeout, that could be a great opportunity there. That's where I love being able to see these percentages because it's how our money relates to everything else going on. Right. That's that is the finish of the story. It tells us the rest of the story in here. Now I'm going to move down here to cost of goods. And again, we get the little uh, little red red triangles tell us exactly what to do with it. And a little feature on this, I just want to share this with you real quick, is you can shrink these and just look at it as the, as the overall, or you can expand it and get the detail out of the GL code area. So our food costs right now is at 11400 and this is the way it's breaking down. I'm spending $2,500 in beef, pork, 1300 in chicken, 1800 in seafood, and then here is the numbers in that relationship. So our food cost is at 35.6%. And then looking down here at beverage, uh, wow, look at that. We are a brew house. We have an awful lot of beer happening around here. Oh, well, then thinking about that low retail number up at the top, maybe the retail is our opportunity, not our takeout on the income side. And we need to produce some badass T-shirts and some hats and some other things to inspire folks to purchase something else when they come in. Something fun to be walking around telling everybody about our brand and business. Uh -huh. So we also have, and we add it all together, we have a 29.8% total cost of goods. And that's kind of, that's where we're sitting right now with our cost of goods. Now, we are in a prime cost model, so let's look at our labor. And once again, you can shrink and expand this as you need. But we've got our salaried managers. I have a manager running a restaurant for me. It's costing me 5500 a month. And then we've got our breakdown. I've got shift supervisors, some shift managers. My front of house is $3,500. My back of house is $550. It's a 9.5%. Might have to talk to Chef about that kitchen cost. Well, but we're also a scratch restaurant, Chris. So we're going to require a little bit more labor in the back of the house there uh, to uh, prep everything. And you should see some relief on the food cost number because we're not purchasing all those things paid for somebody else to, to make them for us. Once again, we're getting a story out of this. And that's my theory. If this was more detailed as the chef, I could see my back of house costs dialed in and I could really back up whether that's happening in my prep room or whether maybe I'm mismanaging some of my scheduling and that's just line labor that's standing around waiting for a ticket. I can't see that right now, but with a few more of those what GL codes, I'd be able to figure that out very, very quickly. Right. So we're using all the raw labor right here in this area. And then 
This is where you need to contact your accountant and find out what our average number is. And this is a percentage that you're paying on your expenses. The reason why this is so important that it's included in your labor is because if you manage this number and this number, you're also managing this number. Yeah, you have to pay it, but it's a relationship of these numbers up here. So we end up with a 31% labor cost overall. And in our building, we have spending $35,000 in our in our top two categories and that's giving us a 61.7 percent prime cost these are our top two controllables in the building and this is what we need to be primarily focused on in managing a successful business right here and if i'm going to set some goals for affecting my food cost or labor cost adding some of those details and some of those GL codes to some of those larger percentage items where it's really driving driving the needle is where I'm gonna attack it. I believe that was the pork and beef category because we sell a lot of burgers with bacon. That's right. With our beer. A lot of money up there. So then we're gonna be the other controllables. Now, and we mentioned on the earlier slide that this is where we're still controllable, but we're not uh, not as, as highly valued as far as the uh, prime cost, but we're still managing this as, as managers. So we've got disposable paper, supplies, support materials. We've got supplies. If people are taking care of the equipment, we don't have to buy too many more spatulas or tongs or you know table levelers or all that other kind of stuff. We do have to spend money. Cash over and short, it, uh, emergency repairs and maintenance. Now, this is the emergency repairs and maintenance because in the other non-controllable piece, we're probably budgeting it out for it. But this is when something breaks down. And that encourages us to actually do the proper maintenance on it. Utilities, I think we had that story a little bit earlier, marketing and entertainment. And so we end up with an overall controllable controllable income of 76%. And then we move on to that back page, as we mentioned, rent over owner income. Yes, you do need, get to pay, need to get paid. We want that. <laughs> and uh, general administration, that's you got to pay for the accountant and all the other consulting services and whatever else you have going on. Taxes, everything else is coming in here. And, oh, look, we've got a bottom line profit of 2996 bucks and a 5.2% profit margin. So for our independent restaurant P&L that we just looked at, 5.2% is good profit, bad profit. It's profit. It's profit. But on the independent, on the national average, this is according to the National Restaurant Association, is the independent is about 4%. So we're doing a little bit better than a benchmark. But I bet if we went back and dug into some of these larger percentage opportunities, that we could make an impact on that and improve our profit margin a little bit more. That's the name of the game. Really why we want to break things out and give you detailed information on where you can spend some time, energy, and effort. Because if I spend a whole lot of time trying to solve a frozen foods product uh, problem, it's not going to have any impact. I want to spend time, energy, and effort where it's going to move the needle. So if we stop burning the bacon in the kitchen and our beef and pork costs go down, then that's something that I could, as a chef, directly see impact the profitability in the restaurant. That's why these GL codes are so important in giving us detail and information and then having it laid out in such a way that we can take action and see where those patterns are. Well, yeah, for a chef or a general manager on the front of the house, because you guys drop plates out there too, we yeah, can that... see how our labor and what they're actually doing with their hands, moving things through space, impacts our bottom line. And it's a great way then to be able to set training goals and coaching goals that we know are efforts that produce more profitability, not just hoping to God that somebody improves in their skill set. Right. If, we're, if I'm dropping plates, that's going to show up right here. That's going to show up right there in our business when we have a spike in something going on. So that's the, if we're watching the right stuff, we get good information to take action on our business. All right, everybody. I think that was a great look at this uh, spreadsheet. Remember, you'll have access to download this after the solution are. And I've got a lot of really great questions popping up here that are all really going to be things that 
pretty much on an individual restaurant basis, you'll have to dive into that and find out by plugging your numbers in where your opportunity lies. We're going to do our last poll question here and move on a little bit. So outside of your P&L, what, uh, what do you find is the biggest opportunity for your business? Are you focusing on making great sales projections? Are you uh, really trying to dial those in so that you know what your budgets are? Are you problem solving your cost of goods, trying to figure out how to really make sure that your recipes are performing for you? Are you working on effective labor scheduling, meaning that you're really trying to dial in that, that cost of those, of those folks? Or is revenue growth your, your primary concern? Let's see what folks are looking at. Revenue growth, man, that just popped up there. It's all moving back and forth, but still, for all of our operators, uh, I think that you folks are just backing up what Chris and I see out there, that there's a lot of competition. There's a tremendous need for quality staff, people in the front of the house that aren't just order takers, that are order makers, that are experience guides, um, that that growth of revenue is really, really critical. Now we understand that labor scheduling keeps popping in and out, depending on your state and your in your in your uh, state wage, that can be a big deal. So I, I understand that, and we're we are have several states on with us right now. So this is an aggregate of of the several states that are watching. So this is fairly fairly common in what we generally see. And, and interestingly enough, sales projections is not the highest on the list, but that's okay. Uh, and sales projections is important, but it. These three items are really the day-to-day -day things that we experience as we're working in our business. So let's talk about some, taking some action on the P&L now, Chris. Okay. So one thing that I always say is a restaurant is dying to tell you its story. In addition to the math formula, the prime cost uh, P&L or worksheet gives you the percentages. The percentages are the color of the story. It really is what tells you the relationship from one number to another to the other and that uh, ultimately the p l is history it's already has happened but it's what you do with that information to utilize it as the canary in the coal mine when something's changing and then ultimately the, your labor is an asset it's not just an expense it is the vehicle for the experience in managing everything in the building in order to have a p l guide you really uh, to to change and, and effective change, look at your percentages. The big ones are where you need to move the needle. So for the chef, the percentage on the bacon and the pork was the critical one when we were looking at that P&L. Absolutely. Then followed what we call the 80-20 rule. The 80-20 rule is really where the bulk of the numbers are. 80% of your profit or sales comes from 20% of your elements, and that's really what if you think in your GL codes, your prime cost is the 20% of your GLs, but it's where it all lives, lies to make some change in your business. And to affect change, you need this info as soon as possible. If you have a food cost problem, the bigger the gap, the smaller the opportunity is to repair any errors you might have in it. So it's really just a matter of breaking these manageable elements into bite-sized chunks, like, hey guys, let's focus on not burning the bacon today. Right. And going back to the 80-20 rule, address the biggest issues first with confidence that will move the needle for you, then move on to the next one. Use as much detail as you need to be effective, but don't become a desk jockey. You don't want to become a desk jockey at all. It, really, the business and action is out on the dining room and what your people are doing with the products. And that's where the battle is really won, is in that dining room, working with our staff and with our great customers. Let's go ahead and wrap up these details, Chris, so we can take a question or two here at the end. So the prime cost, really, we want we want to put you in charge of your own business and be ahead of the curve. Uh, be in control of what matters most in your business. Next, the P&L really is the end result of your restaurant's unique story. The information to control uh, your food, to control your the ability to control your sales through using your labor as an asset and, as opposed to being an expense. And then give yourself the tools to grow your business. Give yourself the gift of time 
and the gift of confidence that this information is actually doing something for you. Really, the prime cost will give you the benchmarks and the confidence to then step away and move on to what's really important and to move the needle in your business. All right, so here's the number one question, and you just said the word confidence, and we had somebody ask, uh, hey, Chris, what if, what if my numbers show I'm upside down? <laughs> well, it gives you the opportunity to actually start digging into the numbers of what it is. And this is what I call the hermit crab theory, is you, you, if you're not where you need to be, you got to look at the shell you have. If you're trying to sell, um, if you're trying to sell a super intensive labor menu and you don't have the talent pool in the market, then you have to adjust to fit the market. If you're trying to sell um, super high-end eclectic food and your community is just isn't ready for that yet, you have to adjust the community. So that gives us the first piece of what's not working inside your business. If you're upside down, a lot of times what we do try to do is we go right to the menu and change the menu rather than looking at the other elements of the business and trying to do something with it. So we have some folks that are, are in a new business and they're having issues trying to estimate their labor and their food because they don't really have a history. Do you have any suggestions for them? Uh, yeah, actually, what we want to do is we want to start with costing your recipes out, making sure that you have good, solid numbers on the recipes. And then you want to try to come up with your best guess if you're a brand new restaurant and you haven't sold anything, what your best guess of what you're going to sell the most of. Typically what we see a lot of times is somebody costs the whole menu out and then takes one of each and says, that's our food cost target. But the problem is if you have something at 11% and something at 40%, but you sell more of the 40% food cost items, your food cost is going to be much higher than that overall list of averages. It's just not going to work. And then, what kind of schedule are you going to run? Is it is it uh, a intensive steps of service schedule? Is it counter service? Is kind of up with the what you think the base menu or base schedule need to run the business? And that might give you a better benchmark of where you're at. The hard part is starting off with the restaurants. You've got no history, but having a starting formula at least to work from, and then you can adjust from it from there. And the one thing I do know is probably what some of my controllable costs are going to be because I've already negotiated rent. I've already anticipated as the owner what I need for an income and some of those other things that I just take care of before we actually open the business. So then I really can just start focusing on my food and, and labor budget. Right. Yeah. You want to really focus on the variables, set those other ones and set them aside and move on. But you have to include those. A lot of times people open up and they don't don't even consider those parts and we get kind of ambushed on the on the PL when it happens. Right. So we have some folks that are wondering again how to prioritize um, and how to how to really attack those areas once they identify that they have a problem. Um, I'm thinking especially if it's a labor cost problem, like the question is, how, what if my labor cost is just too high? How do, right. I, how do I know how many people or when to cut the floor or how to address that issue? That's, uh, boy, actually, you know that, we're gonna, we are going to touch on that one in our next solution R, but let's talk about it right now, is staffing the restaurant. You have two pieces of labor. Two pieces of labor. One is in-service labor, and the other one really is the operations labor. So it takes X amount of hours to open the building. It takes X amount of hours to close the building, which actually has nothing to do with the customer service piece of it. Make sure that those are ticked down to the science of it, that uh, that we know it takes 45 minutes to open the open the restaurant. We know it takes an hour to close the restaurant to all these standards. And then it's a matter of making sure you're spending the right labor in the right places to capturing sales. So if you're uh, just doing the straight line staffing, everybody on it at nine and everybody off by four, there's a sales hump that we're not capturing. So watching where to spend your money in, in relationship to the sales uh, would be probably the best start on that piece, first of all. Oh. So we'll go into depth a little bit more on that yeah, on our, that's next, our, that's our uh, teaser. next solution R. So, well, thanks everybody. We really um, have enjoyed your, your participation today. This is our first solution R. We're really uh, excited that you joined us. Uh, 
we look for an email shortly uh, uh, and there'll be a link to the complimentary Excel spreadsheet and uh, just get a little bit of information on where you're at and how we can help you further. And don't forget, you can always re-watch this solution R uh, to follow along with that spreadsheet and you can stop it and start it and really get your own details dialed in along with Chris's guidance right there just by re-watching it. And then you'll be able to sign up uh, and subscribe to our next solution R and, and it'll be a deeper dive into creating dependable and accurate sales budgets. And it'll be on Tuesday, August 7th, so mark your calendars. Thank you for your valuable time, everybody. Speaking for Chris and I both, man, we strive to support your business advantage and we really had a great time today. Thank you. Thank you.